Okay, so we stopped in the last recording. Uh, we were talking about zirconium monolithics. We discussed uh, the zirconia uh, block composition in details. We stopped here in the aging process or low temperature degradation known as LTD. Low temperature degradation. Uh, zirconia is uh, susceptible to aging or so-called low temperature degradation LTD. During this aging process, the uh, metastable tetragonal phase converts by a slow transformation into the stable monoclinic phase, starting at the surface in the presence of water at relatively low temperatures, or like uh, in the presence of water or uh, um, um, oral fluids or other fluids, because because this uh, uh, we're not just talking now we, here in this lecture we're only talking about uh, dental prosthesis but like I um, uh, pointed before it's used in orthopedics for hip replacement or shoulder replacement or knee replacement they use uh, zirconia joints so it's uh, susceptible to uh, susceptible to uh, low temperature degradation and matters to them and we will uh, touch upon that uh, later in this lecture so it's pretty much it causes uh, surface roughness by uh, surface uplift in the presence of the oral fluids or bodily fluids. All right. Now, uh, okay, that's an example. Hip and knee prosthesis. You know, it's it's a major surgery when they want to replace a knee or a or a hip joint. So uh, they look at. Uh, more than 10 years they want something to, you know the success rate to be above 10 years uh, obviously because it's a major uh, uh, procedure while I think in the dental field five to seven years uh, success rate uh, is okay I will show uh, studies that will talk about success rate uh, for certain prosthesis BFMs and zirconia up to 10 years and there's up to 25 years uh, study on PFMs as well I will show all of that but I wanted to point out that it's very important low temperature degradation is very important in orthopedics and as well as in the dental field all right now I was trying to find out is there anything in the lab or in the clinic that we can do to reduce the risk of low temperature degradation but all I found was this strategies to reduce the risk of LTD particle size reduction and this is the manufacturing level we, we, we can't control that in the lab increasing the uterine continent same thing it's a manufacturing level addition of aluminum oxide now what did we talk about aluminum oxide in the last uh, recording uh, in the third video we talked about that when you add more aluminum oxide continent or the grain size of the aluminum oxide is bigger so when you increase the aluminum oxide oxide in uh, size or amount it will reduce translucency but here we're discussing low temperature degradation the addition of aluminum oxide is beneficial and it lowers low temperature degradation all right so when you add the aluminum oxide you reduce low temperature degradation but you reduce translucency so it has a good effect and a bad effect or let's say when you look at one continent you have to think about multiple things the effect on low temperature degradation and the effect of translucency in the case of aluminum oxide same thing goes for tetragonal when you think about tetragonal you think about translucency more tetragonal less translucency but more tetragonal means more strength so one element will give you many effects on different aspects of zirconia behavior all right so addition of aluminum oxide will reduce low temperature degradation changing the chemical synthesis route to gain zirconium oxide raw particles so as you can see all these four factors are manufacturing factors in the lab there isn't i was thinking about like double glazing or polishing being glazing whatever i can do to the surface to reduce the risk of uh, low temperature degradation but I didn't found uh, uh, any publication that supports that all right so it's all on the manufacturing level as far as I know 
Now, machining can introduce uh, uh, stress or tension to the surface, which can enhance susceptibility uh, to low temperature degradation. In other words, if it's printed, there is least chance or, or lower chance of low temperature degradation. But if it's machined or CAD cammed or milled, then there is a higher risk of low temperature degradation since there is uh, stress and tension, uh, it, it introduces stress and uh, tension to the surface. And we would gonna be talking about printing zirconia. It's a newer thing that's coming up. Uh, and we will talk about it in details uh, when we get to uh, uh, that part of the lecture. Um, same things, the same, uh, same talk about how to reduce low temperature degradation. Honestly, it's all about manufacturing in the lab and the clinic. I didn't find anything that we can do to reduce low temperature degradation. Same illustration, just to touch up on low temperature degradations. We're doing good in low temperature degradations in these generations that we use uh, uh, late, recently. Now, could we mix the particles of both deuterium, uh, three deuterium tetragonal and five deuterium tetragonal, for example? In other words, we said that this block consists of many things: oxides, aluminum oxide, deuterium oxide, uh, hafnium oxide other oxides for coloring uh, and then there's the zirconium oxide in this block so let's say that this block has 90 percent for example of uh, zirconium oxide continent of this 90 percent zirconium oxide continent can we use only five deuterium or could it be a mix of five deuterium and three deuterium does it have to be one uh, shape and form of the deuterium oxide or could it be different shapes and forms of the deuterium oxide now here in the zircad uh, prime uh, evoclarb evident mixed all right so in this step the high strength zirconium oxide raw material which is three deuterium as we established and the high translucent zirconium oxide raw material which is the five deuterium as we established the highest translucent zirconium material are combined in a special way in a special way in multi-layering too so you can say that the inner layer of this block or the cervical middle uh, uh, third continent is more of 3 deuterium tetragonal and then the 5 deuterium tetragonal goes towards the incisal edges and the, the uh, incisal one third. All right. And that would give you uh, a nice degradation of string and translucency. Heat element centering versus microwave centering all right there's a study that says it was revealed that the total centering time was reduced by 75 percent for microwave centering three deuterium uh, stabilized zirconia ceramics to achieve relative density of 98 percent at low centering temperatures that's the key if your block is centered at a low temperature or a lower temperature than what I do. I center on 1450 up to the recommendation of the company that uh, supplies me with blocks. So my blocks are centered on 1450. All right. But if your blocks are centered at a low centering temperature, about 1200 or 1250, then you can use microwave centering and microwave centering would save you 75% of the time. In other words, instead of centering for eight hours, you will center for a couple of hours. Two hours is enough. 75% of the time you save, all right? However, the properties of both microwave centering and conventional centering, uh, centered ceramics are comparable when the centering temperature exceeds uh, 1,250 Celsius. In other words, if there's a block that's centered on a lower temperature, 1200, go ahead for the microwave centering uh, uh, furnaces because it will so it will save you 75% of the time. All right. But as, as I indicated, most of our centering uh, centered blocks uh, in this region uh, mostly comes from Germany and mostly are centered uh, between 1450 to 1550. 
All right, that's the range. I haven't seen a block that's centered on a low temperature, lower than 12, 1200 or lower than 1200 Celsius. Now I put this study up because um, this is a PhD study for uh, a doctor. He's called uh, Muhammad Zahran. He did it in Toronto, Canada, uh, 2014. Uh, I love it, so I put all these uh, highlights and all kind of stuff just to show you that this is a very long study, 2019 pages. This is page 111, I have it in PDF. I've read it more than once and I highlighted uh, uh, much information I, I got out of this uh, PhD study. Uh, it's really worth reading, it's really worth reading if you have the time and the patience to read all of that but anyways because he's uh, he's talking about everything he wants to discuss uh, dr muhammad he brings uh, previous studies all right he gathered previous studies and he discussed them and then he, uh, they would go ahead and do their own experiment and add it and then uh, compare it why is it different why is it a little different why is it too too much different what's the study limitations uh, how did they do it What's the testing mechanism? It's just beautiful. It's 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 something else. If you have the time to read this PhD uh, study, it's it's worth reading, uh, honestly. It says here in this part. This is what I want to quote from it now. The tetragonal crystals in these zirconium oxide ceramics are metastable and can be transformed into larger monolithic crystals with the application of stress from cracks or flaws. This phenomenon is beneficial in hindering crack growth and increasing fracture toughness. Hence, it is referred to as transformation toughening. Transformation toughening uh, is one phenomenon that exists in zirconia. It doesn't exist in lithium disilicates or in other porcelains, especially for zirconia. Uh, it, it pretty much the conclusion of it, you have a tetragonal zirconia now and there is a crack. This, this surface crack is trying to uh, do a propagation, go inside the inner layers of the zirconia. This pressure from the tip of uh, the crack will, 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 uh, uh, will do this effect on the tetragonal zirconia. This tetragonal zirconia, by the effect of uh, the head of the propagation uh, uh, crack, will change, transform to monoclinic larger size uh, 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 shape of zirconia that we talked about the to, mono, to monoclinic phase zirconia this monoclinic phase zirconia has larger size particles and it is capable of hindering or stopping the propagation mechanism so it's a, 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 a crack propagation stopping or hindering mechanism it will stop the crack from going deeper inside of the deep uh, uh, layers of this zircon zirconia all right so it's a good phenomena it will stop not though uh, not heal or not close uh, this crack the, the crack is there and it will remain there but it won't propagate more it won't go inside the deeper layers of zirconia and this phenomenon is, is called transformation toughening now it doesn't exist in lithium disilicate or in other ceramics i look for that it's a specific phenomena that exists in, in, in zirconia. Now, on the, short, in the, in the, on the short term, let's say that this is really good and it's a good phenomena and it helps uh, uh, the zirconia because in, in other products, once there is a crack, it keeps propagating until it breaks and causes the failure of that prosthesis. But this is a, a, a good thing in zirconia, transformation toughening. Uh, but on the other hand, don't forget that there is low temperature degradation. There is always cracks in the outer surface of zirconia. And these cracks, when they're multiple in the outer surface of zirconia, even if they cannot uh, propagate inside of the zirconia, they would cause eventually failure of this zirconia outer uh, layer or outer part. So that's why you see uh, chipping uh, of the zirconia and you see uh, uh, more chipping in the, in the, in the outer zir zirconia. Now, we used to see uh, 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 failures between the bond of the, of the ceramics 
bonded to the zirconium uh, core too and we will discuss that later but here this is a good phenomena on the short term on the long term we really have to take into consideration the low temperature degradation of the zirconia and the ultimate result of, of failure of this zirconia after many years now how many years and how can we reduce that it's all up to uh, science and manufacturing uh, to uh, determine the, com uh, the composition of this block and uh, to uh, and for the studies to come up with uh, success rate for zirconia I have one study that talks about success rate of zirconia 14 years I will uh, illustrate that here I will show that study here in this picture as well but it's good to know that there is a transformation and toughening uh, in, in zirconium uh, when it comes to uh, to hindering or stopping the crack propagation. Now, does this phenomena exist in lithium disilicate? It does not. Is there an itchable zirconia? We will talk about this, this is uh, just uh, brainstorming again, but we will talk about this in its own uh, part of this uh, lecture later on. Itchable zirconia, we'll talk about that. All right. Now, since we talked about seven uh, different types of monolithics we talked about alloy monolithics we talked about acrylic monolithics we talked about snap on smile monolithics we talked about uh, high glass continent the monolithics that was number four number five was composite resin monolithics then we talked about lithium disilicate was number six and number seven was zirconia monolithics we talked we discussed about uh, we discussed these seven uh, kinds of monolithics and now there's there is a product in the market that you should try to, to to know how to classify it is it like let's look at this product for an example what is uh, this product classification because it says zirconium oxide it says lithium oxide and it says silicate oxide uh -huh. so what kind of uh, product is that is it still lithium disilicate or zirconia or, or, or what is it sometimes you see products in the market that you can't easily classify under which classification does it fall of the monolithics that we talked about now fluctual strength of this product Vita Sobrinity is about 500 megapascal all right so it falls into the lithium disilicate strength or the lower zirconia strength but let's let's uh, look at the com uh, at the composition of this block the Vita Sobrinity you see that's the continent of, of uh, that's the continent of zirconia. Zirconium oxide is eight to twelve percent, so very minimum uh, composition of zirconia. Whether the, the the lithium oxide, silicate oxide, so it's more of lithium disilicate or high uh, silicate glass. But yes, they put lithium disilicate in there, 15 21 percent lithium disilicate, and they put a little bit of zirconia, say ten percent of zirconia in that block. But the end of the day, it's a lithium disilicate block. That's what I want uh, to tell you. So you would see that some products are infiltrated with zirconia or infiltrated with glass or infiltrated uh, uh, with the other uh, uh, components. But the end of the day, what's the cluster and what's the matrix and what's the, the, the major continent of that block would make the difference really. So can we enforce glass ceramics with zirconia particles? Yes, we can. Can we mix lithium disilicate with zirconia? Now, we're not talking about infiltration. We're talking about, say, 50-50 uh, mix or 40-60 mix, whatever. Can we really mix zirconia and lithium disilicate? And why would you even think about mixing such two different, uh, such two different materials together? Uh, the answer would be, uh, by me you would hope that mixing lithium disilicate will give you the itchability and the glass and the high translucent of the lithium disilicate and that the zirconia would give you the strength of zirconia and and can we mix it together or not now there is something a study uh, by dr zhu yang uh, you know the the, the very uh, the very short outcome because it's really uh, a long study that's really complicated for a person like me it's too much chemistry as simple as that so gz 
D offers better resistance to immediate fluctuate damage, better aesthetics, and potentially better veneering and cementation properties over homogeneous zirconium oxide deuterium stabilized zirconium. So what does this mean? The conclusion was using a combined glass infiltration densification technique, GZG, with a graded structure can be fabricated. So Dr. Zhu Yang uh, proved that it can be fabricated. I don't know of any block or any final product in the market uh, that was made with this technology, but at least it's proved and, uh, that it can be done, all right? It offers better resistance to immediate fluctuous uh, damage, better aesthetics, and potentially better veneering and cementation properties over homogeneous deuterium stabilized zirconium oxide. All right. Now, this is Dr. Uh, Yu Zhang from New York University College of Dentistry, and he was awarded nearly 3.7 million by uh, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research to carry on with his uh, research um, researches. Uh, if you Google, if you uh, Google on Google Scholar, Dr. Uh, Yu Zhang, you will find much, much publications and. Uh, uh, scientific papers that talk about dental materials and materials in general it's just uh, it, it's a lot and, and, and uh, it's beneficial actually I have benefited a lot from the papers of, of Dr. Zhu Yang uh, as well as Dr. Edward McLaren and others and uh, all institutes you know many institutes uh, that publish uh, their vision of work I have benefited from actually uh, but anyways, so go, going back, so you can have, or it's uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yu Zhang uh, proved that you can mix lithium disilicate with zirconia. It's possible. It's doable. It's manufacturable, as if that's a term. You know, you can manufacture something, a mix, but it's it's uh, it's a complicated process. It has uh, infiltration and uh, densification, and you know. It has, it's a complicated process to come up with, say, I don't know, a block or a powder or a injectable, some form of material that is a mixture of both uh, lithium disilicate and zirconia and gives you uh, both uh, specific, both uh, properties for uh, cementation, translucency and strength. All right. So that would be a breakthrough if it comes out. Imagine just, just not having to choose between lithium disilicate and zirconia anymore. Just, you know, use one block that works for all, you know. It's amazing. Okay. Now, there isn't anything really that's called monolithic abutments. But I put it up anyways because we're talking about monolithic and uh, some abutments are, you know, uh, prefabricated abutments, castable abutments. All kind of abutments we can discuss in this uh, section it's not really a part of monolithic versus layered lecture but I said I'll put it up anyway monolithic abutments just to see what kind of abutments do we have and if we want to apply a classification of monolithic and, and layered which does not really apply but if we want to uh, think about this classification in relation to abutments all right so, uh, this is a slide that I come up with, abutment selection, say that you got an indirect implant impression, a post analog and a model port. Now you have a model, in this model there is an analog. Now you are up to the abutment selection, right? You want to select your abutment. What choices do you have? First of all, there's the trans, uh, transfer abutment, which is the abutment that transfer the relationship from the impression to your cast. And you can use this transfer abutment Cut the, 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 the transfer part of it, the, the top part of it, and then the remaining is your abutment. You use it as an abutment. So it's a transfer and an abutment at the same time. Uh, other kind would be preformed abutments, you know. The preformed abutments, we always have to discuss the size. And, and us dental technicians refer to size. What's the size of this abutment? Well, size could be many things. Size could be you should you should when when you when you say size you should think of three things diameter right 5.0 3.5 3.0 uh, 
4.5, whatever, 4.0. So there's a diameter of that abutment, and there is cuff size, which is the height between the upper rim of the abutment itself, the analog in your model, and the margin line of that abutment, the neck, all right, the neck of the abutment, the cuff size. And then there is the coronal, coronal length. Some companies give you coronal uh, length uh, as an option. Like you can choose two millimeter cuff size and five millimeter coronal length for like deep or high uh, prosthesis, long prosthesis, all right? Uh, and most companies don't give you coronal length. They just, you just choose the diameter and the cuff size when it comes to preformed apartments. Now, that's talking about the, si the size, diameter, cuff size, coronal length. Then you should discuss angulation, the angulation of that abutment. You know it's diameter 4.0, you know the cuff size is 2 millimeter, for example, the coronal length is set, for example. You know the angulation 15%, 25%. And there is abutment material. And you should say a zircon abutment of 4.0 diameter within a 15 degree angulation. or a titanium abutment so there's titanium abutment and there's uh, zircon abutments and I think there's a third kind of abutments uh, that was uh, produced uh, I forgot the composition is some kind of uh, oxide it's an element it's not an alloy it's an element but I can't remember right now if I remember I'll put it in the comments uh, anyways castable abutments there's two kind of castable abutments this is the gold adapted UCLA, you know, University of California, Los Angeles invented this type of uh, abutments, UCLA, the gold adapted that you can cast. It comes with a prefabricated hex with a plastic part on top of it. So you can play with the plastic, you can cut it, chop it off, you can add to it wax on top of it, uh, do whatever you want and then cast them and then they become a one piece. But it's pretty much... Uh, multi-layered it's more than one layer and you've used it together okay and then there is the fully monolithic or the full plastic abutment uh, and I will show uh, photos of that it's um, I was surprised that many people don't know about it but we use it we, we uh, periodically use this full plastic abutment the whole thing is a plastic even the hex all right and you cast the whole thing as one piece of whatever alloy you want and there's a custom mill abutment, of course, the CAD CAM, uh, the MCAD CAM software in, in our machine. You just down, download it or upgrade to it, and then it'll be able to uh, mill uh, custom abutments or custom mill abutments from uh, chrome cobalt or whatever have you. All right. And these custom mill, they come CAD CAM for titanium and zirconia, as we said, and they come hand piece mill abutment. These are annoying. They're big and you have to grind the hell out of them and it takes too much time to grind them and it's, but it's it's a kind of abutments. Now there's other part, kinds of abutments like a multi-unit that we use, you know, uh, the multi-unit abutments, uh, they're good solutions, uh, especially for screw retained uh, prosthesis. But anyway, I just want you to see how much uh, of a selection there is for choosing one abutment. You know, for, for, for a single case, you have many, many options and uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. But once you understand how much of a selection you have and what can you do with it, uh, it gets easier. So in other words, this is the old uh, way of, of uh, CAD CAM, the old way we used to do this uh, uh, design. We used to send the cast and then Astratic, they do the design and we approve it and then uh, they mill for us uh, the abutments. Uh, anyways, this is the new the newer uh, exocad uh, techniques. It's just cases with you know designed, you know how you choose the angulation and everything it was all straight. This case, this UCLA gold adapt abutment, cast it. Uh, just a split technique zirconia abutment. Those are the milled abutments, CAD CAM or hand piece milled. Uh, another technique of just applying opaque under uh, on top of the abutment, you know, and bake it to, to mask the, the grayish or uh, the blackness of the abutment. Uh, now, this I, I want to discuss this with you. Uh, 
uh, I think Stroman have uh, Stroman do have this box too, but this box is from uh, any ridge from Megagen. Uh, I use Megagen. It's a Korean implant company, and I like this box because this lo this box has 16 compartment times three. Uh, each compartment, for example, the first compartment is straight. The second compartment is 15 degrees angle. The third compartment is 25 degrees angle. And each compartment, like I said, there is 16 uh, different uh, abutments that you can pick and choose. They're all plastic, They're just for your own selection to know what to select, what best to select for uh, any case. Uh, for example, for this case, we uh, we manufacture the CAD CAM a lower uh, full arch uh, temporary material okay uh, on on temporary abutments uh, the doctor had uh, temporary cemented this lower of course this is the lower part of the articulator but it's inverted that's why you see the lower as a top but this is the lower part and then we did a final zirconia uh, bridges on the eight uh, abutments, on the eight uh, uh, abutments on the upper jaw. All right. So this was final. The upper was final. So for me to choose the abutments here, the final abutments, I have this box. So you pick and choose the height of the collar, the diameter, the the depth, which is the height, the kind of the coronal length, and everything. All right. So you can only call the doctor. You can simply call the doctor and tell them I want. Uh, number six uh, red one number six uh, purple for example uh, or pink one number six number five red two and you know if you have the abutment you can uh, pick and choose the abutment itself too you know so anyway instead of having big confusion about what to choose what abutment works better you can try all of them you know or most of them and see whatever suits this case as the ultimate selection the best selection and then just call the doctor and order or call the company and order specifically these so sometimes we really have a hard time you you call the company tell you do you think you need angulated you said yeah i think i need angulated it would go you think you need 15 or 25 i'm like i'm not sure send both and i'll ship it back to you if it doesn't work or send the uh you know it's just this makes selection very very easy if you if you buy this box for one time and you use the same uh, the same uh, of course this only works with Megagen if you want something that works with, uh, with Stroman or with uh, Noble Biocare or with other companies Evelyn Direct whatever have you of course I would assume that they have a different box and a different color coding and a different cuff sizes and everything uh, for your cases but it was a big help. Anyway, we talked about monolithic abutments. These are the plastic abutments from CWM, uh, another Korean company that we uh, use here uh, in the Middle East a lot. Uh, it's fully castable. It's unthreaded from inside, and it has hex and everything. And then uh, you just uh, cast it. This case, for example, I had a UCLA, and I had. A fully plastic castable uh, you cast both you know put the margin line where it goes here is the castable uh, in a different view you know you put your uh, margin the way you want you can make it wide you can make it narrow you can do whatever you want and that's a casted hex well of course anything casted the snug fit or the fit of it is not uh, as precise and as snug as the prefabricated of course and that's one uh, positive uh, uh, thing about using UCLA because it's prefabricated hex. The connection with the hex is perfect, perfect fit. It's just snug fit. With the casted, you will feel that there is a fit and everything is fine. But I guess nothing casted gives you the same exact fit as prefabricated. So usually we use it like this you don't depend on it by itself you usually use it with uh, uh, castable uh, with UCLA castable abutments like say that we have four or five implants and it's a one unit bridge prosthesis that will be uh, fabricated on top of it you uh, choose some of it 
the, the extreme uh, angulation okay you can use it from uh, this kind which is the fully castable plastic but you have to include or it's better that you include UCLA's for a good uh, fit uh, for a good uh, fit uh, of the hex so anyway I get I get them used most of, I get them mixed most of the times not this by itself but a mix of UCLA and a fully castable that's that's uh, for, for especially for larger cases anyway that was for monolithic uh, abutments now we can talk about handling for a little bit or oh, actually this is a 35 minute video I think I should stop right now and talk about monolithic prosthesis handling uh, whether it's alloy monolithics or uh, zirconia or lithium disilicates we will talk about monolithic prosthesis handling in the next recording that was the seal uh, of my fourth video thank you for watching